But as good roles grew fewer, O'Hara knew she had reached a creative dead end at Fox. And in 1949, she left the studio in search of better parts. At home, the depressed actress struggled to support her husband, whose dreams of directing had been sidetracked by his drinking. In 1950, O'Hara made Will Price's ambition a reality when she agreed to star under his direction in the drama Tripoli, co-starring John Payne. But on the set, the self-destructive Price repaid Maureen's devotion by propositioning her stand-in and friend, Lucille House. I don't mind telling it. He made it pass at me, and I did the same thing I would do to anyone. I just said, you know, go play your games. I don't play that way. O'Hara hid her misery behind a strong, tough exterior and tried to ignore her husband's humiliating behavior. But the coming years would force Maureen to face her marital crisis and to fight for her reputation amid a public scandal that threatened to destroy her career. You're watching Maureen O'Hara on Biography. 1950 marked the beginning of a new and memorable phase in the career of Maureen O'Hara when the 30-year-old was teamed for the first time with close friend John Wayne in director John Ford's Rio Grande. Follow me! John Ford had always wanted to pair his two favorite stars, and his instincts were superb. On screen, Maureen was Wayne's equal in courage and stature. Here is romance, warm and daring. Here is a woman's torture, fighting for her boy, a soldier, before he is a man. It would be a start if you'd let Jeff go. I'll get you back. If that were a condition. They had a kind of a competition. If she could outact him, she would. And if he could throw her, he would. <laughs> no, but it was all fun. Wayne, on one occasion, said that Maureen O'Hara was one of the greatest guys he knew. But away from John Ford's direction, Maureen was frustrated to find herself still saddled in Hollywood with the kind of cardboard role she had tried to escape. Typical was the pirate tale against all flags, which teamed her with an aging Errol Flynn and with her friend Anthony Quinn. I told you that I would kiss when I had a fancy for kissing, didn't I? Well... Get to it, Mr. Hawk. She was wonderful, I mean, in doing uh, stunts and pictures. I remember the Maureen would often take away the sword from someone who was doubling her, and she said, you know, and this is the way it was doing. And Maureen was very, very courageous about doing a lot of the stunts. Fortunately, a far greater project was just ahead for Maureen, one that happily reunited her with John Wayne and John Ford on the director's dream project, the gentle Irish drama, The Quiet Man. I'd like to tell you about The Quiet Man. He's John Wayne in a picture you'll soon be cheering. It's the story of Sean Thornton, a right intended man who came from America to forget his past in Innisfree. There he met a fiery red-headed lass, and the village marriage broker went to work. That's a pretty bonnet you have on. Bonnet? Don't you be talking to me about bonnets. After leaving mine stuck up there like a... Easy now. Have the good manners not to hit the man until he's your husband, and until you hit your back. O'Hara loved the juicy role of Mary-Kate Danaher, a strong-willed Irish woman who's more than a match for the stubborn ex-boxer. So bold one you are. And who can you leave to be kissing me? So you can talk. Yes, I can, I will, and I do. And it's more than talk you'll be getting if you step a step closer to me. Don't worry, you got a wallop. You'll get over it, I'm thinking. Well, some things a man doesn't get over so easy. Like what, supposing? Like the sight of a girl coming through the fields with the sun on her hair, kneeling in church in a place like a saint. 
saint indeed. And now come into a man's house to clean it for him? But that was just my way of being a good Christian act. I know it was, Mary Kate Denner. Ford's weakness was pulling any kind of performance out of women. Now, there's one obvious exception, and that's the quiet man, and that's Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. They're the right age for each other. They're the right temperament from each other. They're just an ideal combination. The familial atmosphere on the set allowed for a series of practical jokes between Maureen, Ford, and Wayne. He'd be dragging her down this path, and there would be manure and things, and so his group would kind of push the manure into the path, and her group would go and push it off. And so they had battles back and forth, like not battles, but, you know, fun. John Ford, being John Ford, put the wind machine behind her so that her hair was whipping across her eyes. So she got very angry and said, what does a bald-headed old SOB know about hair lashing in front of his eyes? And she was waiting for him to either kill her, as she says, or laugh at her. And he chose to laugh. In 1952, Maureen much preferred the company of friends like Wayne and Ford to that of her alcoholic husband. And weekends on the director's boat became a refuge for O'Hara and her young daughter, Bronwyn. After The Quiet Man, Maureen's brother Charles came to Los Angeles from Ireland and saw firsthand the depth of his sister's depression at home. I saw what the situation was, and I convinced her that the church did not have anything against a civil divorce. In 1952, an exhausted Maureen filed for divorce. During the three-year battle that followed, O'Hara's dislike of Will Price grew to hatred as the couple fought over control of Bronwyn. In 1955, the actress was overjoyed to win custody of her daughter, and she found much-needed affection from a new companion, millionaire Enrique Parra. The Catholic O'Hara could not remarry until after Will Price's death, and she kept her current romance as quiet as possible. But that privacy was shattered in 1957 with a shocking story in the pages of Confidential Magazine. The muckraking tabloid had terrorized the film industry for years with scandalous tales about the secret lives of movie stars. Now, it accused Maureen of half-clothed sex acts with a Latin Lothario in the back row of Grauman's Chinese Theater. The image-conscious actress was humiliated, and she knew her career was at stake. Enraged, O'Hara joined forces with the FBI and became a star witness in its prosecution of Confidential Magazine. My testimony, I will stand by it, it is the same as always, that this incident never occurred in Roman's Chinese or any other theater. The trial filled the headlines. The jury was bussed across town to see the alleged seat in Grauman's, and one theater employee identified Maureen under oath. But the case changed dramatically when Brother Charles stepped in with a trump card, O'Hara's passport. And in her passport, she was not even in this country when the uh, incidents had taken place. And this was the final blow. This is what put the magazine out of business. The proud, strong-willed actress had saved her career and her reputation. And best of all, in the decade to come, Maureen O'Hara's personal life would achieve its greatest fulfillment in a romance rivaling anything she had played on screen. Biographies look at Maureen O'Hara will continue. But first, for a complete list of Maureen O'Hara's films, visit biography.com. Maureen O'Hara makes to get down here because the true daughter of the Emerald Isle and great motion picture star tonight, this is your life, Maureen O'Hara. By 1957, Maureen O'Hara had much to celebrate. She had recently survived a bitter divorce and had won a highly public lawsuit against the notorious tabloid Confidential Magazine. But despite those victories, O'Hara was still frustrated by mediocre film roles as she approached her 40th birthday. Ever restless to work, 
Maureen shifted her career focus. She showcased her attractive singing voice in a series of television appearances, record albums, and the 1960 Broadway musical, Christine. And in 1961, after years of forgettable film roles, Maureen scored the greatest box office hit of her career with a family comedy for Walt Disney Studios. This was Mom, and this was Dad, soft music candlelight dinner and romance on the rocks oh i admit i'm not as young as that simpering baby-faced platinum dog who's got her hooks in now you don't get started on vicky oh yeah. that's right don't say anything about that dear sweet precious vicky that plot-faced child bride and her electric hips in the parent trap o'hara showed strong comic flair as the mother of twins played by Haley mills who are determined to reunite their estranged parents. Let's get together right away. We'll be happy twice and fall on. And you can always count on me. A bruise of tooth that we will be. Let's get together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she was a darling. She is a darling. Warm and sweet and gorgeous. I love to think that she was my mother. I was dazzled by her, actually. I saw Parent Trap, and I thought, ah, that's just like Maureen. I can see expressions exactly like I see all the time when she's talking to Bronwyn. I thought that's exactly what Maureen would do and what Maureen would say. The success of The Parent Trap launched O'Hara on a string of family comedies, including a teaming with Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Hobbs Takes a Vacation. Yeah. Will you come here a minute? Yeah. That's it, Grandma. 36, 26, 36, and still operating. <laughs> In McClintock, O'Hara again showed her gift for physical comedy with old pal John Wayne in this Western version of The Taming of the Shrew. The screen hasn't seen such a rip-roaring, no-holds-barred Donnybrook in years. And you have ever seen so much wild, frantic fun as John Wayne as the immovable G.W. McClintock clashes head-on with an irresistible firebrand of a redhead named Maureen O'Hara. The scenes from McClintock, she did every one of those. She took some very big chances. But she loved it, and John Wayne uh, did not pull any punches with her. When he spanked her, he spanked her, and she was black and blue. But, you know, no way would she let him know that, <laughs> that he was bothering her.